Good morning. Welcome to Colonial Heights United Methodist Church. For those who are worshiping with us online, we're, we're glad that you've joined us. We want to make you aware that today's service will be somewhat abbreviated because we're going to talk about the life of the larger United Methodist Church and what happened at General Conference. You are welcome to stay online and join us, and we would welcome your questions if you would like to email me. That information is available on our website. We'll be glad to do our best to answer what questions we have. And it, I view it as it is part of worship because all that we do, we do in honor and for the glory of God. And yes, that includes general conference and annual conference and business meetings of the church because that's how we organize ourselves and go out into the world to be a light for Christ. So we are glad that you've joined us today. We will open with a moment of silence to focus us in on God's presence. God, we thank you for your presence with us now and always. Help us to keep our eyes and ears open and our hands and feet ready for action for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing. We're in the celebration hymnal, number 589. We'll sing the first and third verses. Set a feast 
One of the questions that the retirees are asked when we retire at annual conference is what is your favorite hymn? Patrick didn't know it, but this is mine. And not only that, but I have put a caveat if you should read what's posted in those booklets, and that is that this song is more dangerous than any pack of cigarettes. Yeah, 22 years ago, sitting at Emerald Avenue United Methodist Church with my nice cushy job, I kept singing this song. I think we ended up singing it every Sunday because that's all I could hear. So be careful what you sing and what you say when you sing it because God takes you seriously. And not only do we go where he sends us, we go into places and send Stuff. Methodists are really good about sending stuff, all of us. And so what is in these big orange buckets is not Gatorade, it is not football, basketball, or baseballs. It is food that will be shipped to Zimbabwe. And for those who get to experience annual conference, one of the highlights is when they have multiple tractor-trailer trucks full of food and supplies going to people we will never meet, and they sound the horn. Makes me cry to think about it. It is beautiful what God does when we answer his call. Let us pray. Lord, we ask your blessing upon these beautiful buckets for all that's gone in to prepare them, for all that will go into getting them to the places that they are most needed. Fill bellies, but most of all, God, fill hearts. Fill them with the knowledge that there is a God greater than anything on earth and anything that we can imagine that loves them and that it is sent with the love of people here in Colonial Heights. We give you our thanks and praise for calling us for working through us, and for the privilege of being part of your kingdom in the power of Jesus Christ who taught us all to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together again and grab your celebration hymnals and turn to number 562, Be Thou My Vision. We'll sing the first and last verses.
And at this time, we will receive our morning offering. The way we do that is you bring your gift up to the offering plate. There's one on either side at the front, or you may leave it as you go. And we always talk about the wonderful things that your generosity does. And today, on behalf of all of the staff of the church, I would like to thank you. Because part of your giving goes so that we can do what we love and you get paid to do it. So we thank you very much.
God, it is with gratitude that we give freely into your kingdom so that all would know your love and grace. We ask your blessing upon the gift and the giver in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oftentimes, I come down there, and when people always sit at the back, I had a church member one time said that if the mountain won't come to Muhammad, Muhammad will go to the mountain. So Muhammad's going to go to the mountain, and I'm going to come down here with you guys today, even though you're nice and spread out. I like this. And somebody's already asked. She's up to something today. From Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 to 29. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of God for the children of God. In your bulletin, you will find a half sheet of paper, or should find a little half sheet of paper with some lines on it that says, Labels During My Lifetime. I want you to grab a pen or a pencil, and we're going to give about a minute and a half or two minutes, and I want you to list every single label that you can remember that somebody's given you in your life. For instance, this is my, part of my list, smart, ragamuffin, lazy, house cat, preacher, salesperson, too tall, too short, too sensitive, too analytical, too much personality, too serious, too young, too old, hot rod. <laughs> that was before ministry. <laughs> Mama, Nana, sister, daughter, progressive, traditionalist, centrist. Republican, Democrat, Independent. What are your labels that people have attached to you? And in the column next to it, simply put a plus if, it, if you took it as a positive, negative if it was a negative, or if you're not quite sure how the person meant it, put a question mark. Two minutes starting now.
That's about a minute and 45 thereabouts. How many of you, how many of you have, half of those labels are positive? How many of you have half of those labels that are negative? Ooh, lucky crowd. <laughs> Emotionally healthy, you forgot them all. <laughs> How many have a lot of questions by their label? Question marks, you're not sure if it's a positive or a negative label. Anybody got a lot of those? All right. So, does those labels, do those labels, tell everything that there is to know about you? No. No, they don't. So, this, and it wasn't full, I didn't eat them all, I refilled it. I ate them all last year, and this is the refill from the beach trip. So. Just so that you know, it wasn't full. I didn't eat them all. It is peanut butter M&Ms. Everybody agree that that label is accurate. Are these peanut butter M&Ms? Because what? Depends on how fat they are. Then they're not the peanut butter ones, are they? These are not peanut. These are peanut butter. These are peanut butter. So, I think, you want some? I would pass them around, but you know, since COVID, I can't do that because you put your hand in the jar. I thought about that. So, we can see through that there are definitely M&Ms in here. Now, we might not be able to see what's inside and know for sure that it's peanut butter, but they are the fat ones. If you know, if you know M&Ms, these are, these are the plump, juicy ones, and, and so we're pretty safe because we can actually see them that these are peanut butter M&Ms. So is the fact that there are peanut butter M&Ms in this jar, labeled peanut butter M&Ms, is that good or is it bad? Then you know what's in the jar. But the fact that they're peanut butter M&Ms, are they good or are they bad? They're good. Does anybody in here have peanut allergies? Ooh, not good. We don't even want to open this jar around some folks that have peanut butter allergies, right? So if it's good or bad, really depends. Does it tell us everything about the peanut butter M&Ms? Does it tell you that it's crunchy on the outside and sweet? Nope. That label doesn't tell you that. Does it tell you that there's chocolate in there with the peanut butter? Eh, you gotta read the fine print, but it's there. Still doesn't tell you everything about it. Does it tell you, let's see what else is, oh, does it tell you that if you eat one of them, you're not gonna eat just one? Yeah, they do tell you. They at least warn you. No warning on the peanut butter M&Ms. Does it tell you it's going to raise your blood sugar? Yeah. <clears throat> on the back, doesn't it, Judy? Yeah. You got to look at the fine print on the back, but it, it'll tell you. Still doesn't tell you everything that you need to know about a peanut butter M&M. And is it the same if I tell you, or as Chuck's mouth is watering, if I give you one of those peanut butter M&Ms to experience for yourself, Even though we can see through the jar, and even though it has a label, we don't even know everything about those peanut butter M&Ms. How about those labels that people give us or we give other people? Can we see what's on the inside to know for sure? No. Now, what about this? This says it is Pringles, and it's not just any ordinary Pringles, for those who like Pringles. This is the Harvest Blend. They're blended with sweet potatoes, also smoky barbecue. 
Not bad. I could pass those around. Is that, can you see through the jar? Do you know for sure? That doesn't quite sound like Pringles, does it? Well, we can open it up. Sorry, Chuck. I can affirm to you that that is a sweet potato barbecued hint Pringle. But Rhonda's tricky like this. There's other stuff in there. What's this? Can you see that? Checks mix. There's the checks. There's a wheat checks, rice checks, corn checks. And these little squiggly things they could have left out as far as I'm concerned. And pretzels. There's all kinds of things that have been put in that can besides what's on the label of Pringles. You just never know for sure, do you? We can't know everything by the label, can we? Oh, let's see. Yeah, there was the surprise in that can. Mm. Oh, okay. What about this one? This says salted mixed nuts. Are there salted mixed nuts in this can? How many say yes? How many say no? For those who are saying no, why do you believe that there's not mixed nuts? The label says there's mixed nuts. Because of what? Based on what we know about you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that label. I'll take that. I'll take that. Based on knowing me, but also your what? Your experience, right? Some of you know from experience that this might not contain mixed nuts. Also, because we're all mixed nuts, we know what mixed nuts are like. <laughs> He's going to point it at me. <laughs> and, oh, you didn't think I was going to get it. And what's funny is snakes keep coming up around the house in here. It actually isn't a snake. I was really glad to see that when it popped open today. You know, things aren't always what we label them, are they? You know? The label says there's nuts, but there's not nuts in the cans. The label says there's Pringles, and there's Pringles, but a whole lot more. The label says there's M&Ms, but we don't know it all until we experience it for ourselves and taste them. So, would you like for someone to form a singular opinion about you based on one of those labels on your list. Anybody want to do that? No thanks. No thanks. Amen. Amen. So do the labels that we hear so often tell us anymore? Labels like conservative, which got to be so negative, they now call it traditionalist. We changed it. Or the label liberal, which is now progressive. Again, it became so negative, we had to change the label so it was more palatable. Or independent or centrist. Do those labels tell us everything there is to know about a person? Do those labels really tell us much of anything? May I suggest we stop using them as much as possible. We humans can't help but judge. We've already talked about that many times in the garden. We can't help but to judge. That's why we need a Savior. And if we wake up every morning and we ask that Savior to set our minds straight, to help us to avoid receiving labels upon ourselves that do not fit, or maybe correcting some labels that do fit, and that we don't place labels on other people and accept that for everything there is to know about that person. 
There is but one label that accurately describes every single person. It is given to us by God, and it is beloved child. That is the only label you should let stick to you or that you should try to place on anybody else. Beloved child of God. That is not the preacher's proclamation. That is God's proclamation. I would challenge you that in the coming days, weeks, months, and beyond, you strive to lose the labels that have been tacked on to you and that you don't tack any on anybody else because labels divide. Labels destroy. Labels hurt. The only label we need to place on anyone is beloved child of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have come to die for us all, making us all beloved children, claiming us as your own. We ask that you would help us in our weakness, that we would not judge a person by a singular label, that we would not judge ourselves or anyone else based on anything but being your beloved child through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This morning we are going to receive communion together. We have, we're going to receive it by intinction, which means I will Break the bread will be broken and given to you, and you dip it into the cup. The usher will direct you as it's time. We also have a gluten-free option. If you prefer, simply ask for it. Um, and any other instructions? Oh, you may spend time at the altar in prayer, but as you leave, there are a couple of things. One is the handout. For Dell's presentation, you want to pick that up as you go back to your seat. And you know that list of labels? There are a, there's a trash can right over here, and there is a trash can right over there. And I invite you to put your list of labels in that trash can, if you please. Today we'll be using an abbreviated form of the Great Thanksgiving and I get to give it, and you guys can just be quiet and enjoy the words and receive this. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and your Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is not only the gift given to us by Jesus Christ, the breaking of his body, but it is the mission of the church in the world to be broken and given to all. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, God, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world redeemed by his blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forevermore through Christ, with Christ, in Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honor, glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask Del, who's going to assist, and then our musicians, if they will come first to be served, and then the usher will direct you.
Now, I would like to turn over the pulpit to, I started to say Reverend Del Holly. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, <laughs> maybe that's a premonition someday. Um, he will discuss with you. Does everyone have their pamphlet? Anybody need one? Okay. are asked to, um, to deal with. Um, so let, let me start by saying that I'm, I'm thankful and appreciate um, Rhonda's invitation uh, this morning to come and talk to you firsthand about what happened at General Conference this year. And I, I, I see that it's 16 minutes till 12. No, my oh. All right, can, it, can you hear me now? All right, I, I see that it's 16 minutes till 12 and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do my best to rock and roll a little bit so that uh, we get upstairs for lunch by noon. Um, let me, uh, it occurred to me when I was going through my notes, uh, getting ready for today, that it was 25 years ago this year that I was first elected as a delegate to uh, jurisdictional conference. And, and that wasn't really the thing that struck me. It wasn't the election as a delegate, although it was an interesting experience and began a, uh, a journey on kind of the leadership side of the church that I'm very thankful for. Um, but what I remembered about that was how how I came to even consider putting myself in the pool of people to be elected uh, in 1999. Um, and, and that was that David Loveless came up to me one Sunday after church. David was our pastor here at the time. And he said, have you thought about being a nominee for General and Jurisdictional Conference at Annual Conference this year? And I said, well, not really, because I had, at that point, I had been to annual conference enough to kind of have an idea who the real leaders were. And I was new enough to all this church leadership stuff that I didn't necessarily count myself as part of that group. Um, but David was very encouraging. Uh, and as a result of the conversations that he and I had, I did come to be a nominee that year and, and was elected to the jurisdictional conference delegation. And every four years since, I've been part of the General and Jurisdictional Conference delegation in one way or another. Um, and so I'm, I'm thankful as I remember David this morning, but the reality is that that conversation that David and I had that led to me getting started in this process um, was just one of many conversations that had happened over the years that I've grown up in the United Methodist Church um, and been nurtured by the laity and the clergy. And so um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful to all of you because um, all of you have been part uh, of that process in my life. And so it's been a real privilege. This was my fifth general conference to attend. And um, this summer in July, when jurisdictional conference meets, it'll be my seventh jurisdictional conference to attend. Uh, and it's been a great privilege for me to serve the church um, in this way. Um, general conference is, a, is kind of an odd thing in Christendom because uh, remember that the, the Methodist movement in America was forming into a Protestant denomination at the same time that the country was forming into a democratic republic. And I believe that the people who were organizing the Methodist church at that time were heavily influenced by what was going on on the political side in terms of structure. Because if you look at our structure and you compare it to the structure of the United States government, you'll see a lot of similarities. 
Um, now, one of the things that happens in all that is that the General Conference is identified in the Book of Discipline as the only body that has the authority to speak on behalf of the United Methodist Church. So when, when a pastor stands in the pulpit and tells you something, when a lay person stands in the pulpit and tells you something, when a bishop stands in the pulpit and tells you something, we're all just telling you what we think and what our individual opinions are. If you want to know what the church says about something, you look to see what has the General Conference done to, um, to make a statement on behalf of the church. And so the places you look are places like the Book of Discipline. Um, there's a, a complimentary volume to the Book of Discipline called the Book of Resolutions. But this is the way that the General Conference speaks is through legislative actions that are uh, incorporated into the discipline in the Book of Resolutions and also by taking action at General Conference to give direction to the general boards and agencies. Um, so I, I just, I, I want you to be aware that whenever you pick up a newspaper and see that some general secretary of some general board or agency is standing on a sidewalk in Washington, D.C. or New York City telling you what the United Methodist Church says, does, thinks. Um, understand that person is speaking from their perspective in whatever office they hold, but they're not speaking on behalf of the church. If you want to know what the church says through that general conference, look in the Book of Discipline, look in the Book of Resolutions. Now, the other thing that I want to say about the, uh, along those lines before I get into the meat um, is there is a lot of stuff out in the world, a lot of people out in the world that want to tell you what the United Methodist Church did in April and May, and they want to tell you what the impact on the denomination and on local congregations is going to be. Many of those people have really good intentions. They have really good hearts. Some of those people are just trying to stir up controversy. Many of those people are sharing information that is at least partially accurate. A lot of those people are sharing information that is what they assume or what they think based on what they've heard somebody else say, but they haven't looked at the source documents to find out for themselves how much of what they're saying is true and how much is not. That kind of information, if you want it, is out there in places like Facebook and YouTube videos and TikTok videos and X, those kind of social media platforms. You can, I promise you, you can spend all day every day for a week or more doing nothing but reading what somebody has to say about what happened in Charlotte. Um, and that's, that's fine. That, that's every individual person's decision to make if that's where they want to go to get their information. I would just encourage you, if you're basing your understanding of what happened at General Conference from a video you watched on YouTube or a tweet you read, take it with a grain of salt. And I want to encourage you to look for the original source information before you jump to a conclusion about what the person in this YouTube video just told you. And the places you can look are on the United Methodist Church's website, you can follow links to General Conference. And there's a whole page about General Conference. And on that page, there are daily news reports, updates that the news service published. There are um, um, there are videos that UM Communications put together where they interviewed people that were there at, at General Conference and got their reaction to things. That's a really good source of information. Um, ResourceUMC.org is the website where you can go to get the official documents. If you want to see for yourself what the language of a petition was or what the language of a report was, you can get it through resourceumc.org. Um, there's also a website called dailychristianadvocate.org. The Daily Christian Advocate 
is the official publication at General Conference that details the day-to-day -day activities of the General Conference when it's in session. And so if you go to dailychristianadvocate.org, you can access this, everything I'm holding in my hand, plus all these books. Now, the, the caveat about dailychristianadvocate.org is, I know that before General Conference, there was a subscription fee that you had to pay to access that website. Um, I don't know if you still have to pay to get in or not, but, um, but that is the website that will provide you with the most detailed information. Uh, and, and the nice thing about it is, you can search by calendar item number, petition number, legislative committee, you can actually see if there's a specific piece of legislation that you want to learn about, that's probably the best place to do it. Um, and then the last thing is that these, uh, these other books, the Advanced Daily Christian Advocate, are available through resourceumc.org as PDF files. And those contain everything that was distributed to the General Conference delegates in advance of General Conference. Um, they're, they're in those books. So those resources are out there. The Holston Conference website, the communications team in the conference office, also they were with us in Charlotte. They were making videos, they were doing podcasts, they were writing daily uh, summaries, and all of those things are available through the Holston website. Um, and then having the opportunity to talk to people like me that were actually there. You know, you, you all have a great, I, I don't want to blow my own horn, but you, you all have a great source of information because if you've heard that something happened at Charlotte and you want to know, call me, text me, email me, stop me after church, and, and if I remember, I'll tell you, yeah, that happened or no, that didn't happen. Um, but but I, I, just, I just want to offer that word of warning. Be, be careful about what you're reading and hearing, particularly on social media platforms, um, before you just jump the gun and say, oh, that must be, that must be what happened. All right, five, we got five minutes, so let me, what I'm gonna do is kind of run through and, and I'm gonna summarize what's in the packet that's in front of you, and then I'm gonna offer, while we're eating lunch upstairs, if, if you've heard something, if something I say raises a question in your mind, um, it will not offend me if you come over while I'm eating fried chicken and ask me to stop chewing for a second and answer your question. Um, I, I want to I do that for you. If you were following any of the media uh, preparation for General Conference, you know that a lot of people were talking about the three R's that were kind of the main issues at General Conference. And, and I would suggest to you that there were three R's and a big D that were kind of the, the big issues that, it, that were on everybody's mind going into Charlotte. The R's were restrictive language, regionalization. I, I knew if I didn't write it down, I would. Region, regionalization, restrictive language, oh, revised social principles. And the big D was disaffiliation. So I wanna, I wanna start with those because those are the ones that most people were talking about and um, what you're probably most, if you've, if you've made a special effort to be here this morning or, or watch online, those are the things that you're probably most interested in. So let me start, the big, big one was restrictive language. And so what I mean by that is, the United Methodist Church was formed in 1968 by the union of the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren Church. All right, now the Methodist movement and some version of the Methodist Church as a denomination goes back way beyond that. But, but when we talk about the United Methodist Church, that started in 1968. In 1968, when the United Methodist Church formed, um, the, the 1968 General Conference adopted a book of discipline. And in fact, I had my 1968 book of discipline out the other day reading it, uh, looking at it to compare to the 2016 version. Um, and one of the things that you notice is in the, in the 1968 Book of Discipline, um, there, there aren't social principles like we have in the Book of Discipline now. The social, the social principles came 
at the first General Conference in 1972. And in 1972, when the social principles were presented, there was language in the social principles that had to do with human sexuality and specifically issues around homosexual relationships. And there was debate on the floor about what the language in the social principles ought to be. And the end result of the vote in 1972 was the insertion into the social principles of what's been referred to as the incompatibility clause. And the incompatibility clause was a statement in the Book of Discipline that said the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, as a result of that, for every general conference since 1972, there's been debate around the incompatibility clause, whether to leave it or take it out, and whether to add more restrictions to the Book of Discipline. And generally speaking, what has happened over time is that more restrictions have been added. And so by the time we get to Charlotte in 2024, the Book of Discipline has the incompatibility clause in the social principles. We have chargeable offenses for clergy related to uh, being self-avowed practicing homosexuals, um, performing same-sex wedding ceremonies. We have prohibitions in the Book of Discipline that don't allow the use of church facilities or church funds for the promotion of homosexual activities, for the performance of same-sex weddings. Um, we have prohibitions against commissioning, ordina uh, ordaining, uh, accepting as candidates for membership, consecrating as bishops, self-avowed practicing homosexuals. And uh, again, if you've been following what's been going on in the United Methodist Church, particularly for about the last 25 years, you know that um, there are places in the United States in particular, more so than around the world, where, uh, where there's been open disobedience to that language in the Book of Discipline as, as a um, protest of the language being there. So that's the context of where we are as General Conference opened this year in Charlotte. And there were lots of, of petitions that were filed to change the language, to remove the language. There were some that were kind of left over from pre-pandemic to strengthen the language. The end result of the debates on, on the um, human sexuality language was that uh, everything specifically related to self-avowed practicing homosexuals and prohibitions related to that was removed from the Book of Discipline. The prohibition um, on churches allowing facilities to be used and pastors being allowed to perform same-sex weddings has been removed. Um, I, I would say that the impact of doing that is the Book of Discipline on those issues is now in a neutral position similar to where we were in 1968 when the church was when the denomination was formed and we didn't have anything about it in the book of discipline so there's not anything pro there's not anything against um, the exception to that I, a couple of exceptions to that would be there was debate around some language about a definition of marriage um, and we, we still have a definition of marriage in the Book of Discipline, and I would, the definition that was offered in the Revised Social Principles was um, a, uh, a, essentially a consensual, uh, um, committed relationship between two persons. One of the Central Conference delegates during debate offered an amendment to insert parenthetically or one man and one woman. So it, the, the definition of marriage has a little bit of confusion to it, but I, I think the intent of the legislation was um, to define marriage as a consensual committed relationship between two persons and sometimes those two persons will be one man and one woman. Um, the, other, the other thing has to do with funds, that there, there was some language in, so previously the discipline said 
no church funds will be used to promote the practice of homosexuality. The language that is there now uh, takes that part out, but it also, it, it, there was language inserted about the use of denominational funds to uh, provide educational materials. That, that's my, my wording of it. Um, re related. Uh, the idea was specifically to allow church agencies, um, especially those dealing with young people and youth, to be able to spend money to produce educational materials for young people who may be struggling with issues that lead in the direction of suicide. That was the intent behind it. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that that's exactly what the language says, but that was the intent from the person that, that offered that. All right, so where, okay, I, I fibbed because it's three minutes after 12, but nobody's acting like they're going to get up and leave. Um, I want to tell you where I, where I think uh, this, this leaves us right now in terms of the church's position on human sexuality issues. That is, pastors are free to decide what weddings they will or will not perform whether they're heterosexual weddings or homosexual weddings. Um, it's up to the pastor to decide. Churches are free to decide what they're going to allow their facilities to use. And in fact, the Judicial Council was asked during General Conference to rule specifically on who has the authority to decide how the church building is used, the Board of Trustees of the local church or the pastor. And the Judicial Council said it's the Board of Trustees. So congregations get to decide how their facilities are used. Pastors get to decide what weddings they're going to do or not do. Um, the fact that the pastor at one church makes a decision one way or one local church board of trustees makes a decision one way doesn't mean that the United Methodist Church five miles down the road has to decide the same way. It's up to individuals and congregations to decide. Same uh, with ordination, commissioning, acceptance into um, uh, certifying candidates for ministry. It is up to district committees on ordained ministry. It's up to conference boards of ordained ministry to decide uh, to, to go through the discernment process with those persons and help discern who, who's being called to ministry and then to facilitate their preparation for ministry. And it's, it's up to those boards to decide about things like licensing and ordination and commissioning and those kinds of things. Um, now, the, the weirdness that that throws, I think, into all this is that the United Methodist Church is part of a movement that has historically been connectional. And what that means is all, the, all congregations play by the same set of rules, and all pastors play by the same set of rules. And leadership structures within the church are governed by the same set of rules. And so we haven't really called on congregations and pastors to exercise autonomy in the ways that they're doing ministry. That is, this is a change in that kind of attitude. And it, so the question mark in my mind is, does this change that provides autonomy to pastors and local congregations, is it the first step away from our traditional connectional structure and movement toward a more congregational structure? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not going to spend time talking about this more. And just know that's something that's on my mind, and I'm happy to talk to anybody that might have thoughts about that. All right, regionalization, the second big R. Currently, the, the United Methodist Church is organized into jurisdictional conferences in the geographical regions of the United States, and outside the United States, we're organized into central conferences. In the central conferences, that is, those annual conferences that are outside the boundary of the United States, there is limited ability for the central conferences to make adaptations to certain parts, not every part, but certain parts of the Book of Discipline in order that the language of the discipline fits their particular cultural, geographic, political context. The, the reason for that is we're, 
at the general conference level, we are dominated by United States citizens. Most of the delegates are from the U.S., most of the leadership in the church is from the U.S., most of our general boards and secretaries, most of our bishops. I mean, we're a very heavy U.S. denomination. However, our structure is global. We're not a United States church that has satellites in other countries, at least not on paper. Now, that, I mean, that's a point of debate about whether we're operating in a way that's not exactly the way we've said we'll operate, but that's a, that's a topic for another day. On paper, there is, um, there's parity of power within the leadership structures of the church. Um, and, and so sometimes what happens is because we're so heavily U.S. at the general conference level, the general conference delegates spend a lot of time debating and voting on legislation that really only matters in the United States. And we end up putting stuff in the Book of Discipline that just won't work in Uganda or it won't work in Germany. Um, and so we have given the, the central conferences the ability when we do that at the general conference level and we put something in the Book of Discipline that's not going to work in their context or it's going to create political issues in their context. We've given them the authority to modify the Book of Discipline to allow them to do that. We don't have the same ability to do that within the United States. And, and so, um, you know, if we think about an issue differently in the South than maybe they think about on the West Coast, that doesn't get reflected in the Book of Discipline because everything in the Book of Discipline applies to uh, every jurisdiction in the United States, and those are decisions that are made at the general church level, the general conference level, because we don't have a United States equivalent of a central conference. So regionalization is an effort to move the church in that direction. And, and what the regionalization legislation will do um, is it will change central conferences to regional conferences and it will create a regional conference in the United States that sits between the jurisdictional conferences and the general conference. And it's going to allow then for adaptation in all the regional conferences of, again, not all, but some parts of the Book of Discipline. For the, the parts of the Book of Discipline that only the general conference is going to deal with are the theological statements, the doctrinal statements, the historical statements, and the social principles. All that stuff, only general conference is going to be able to, and, and the Constitution. Those are things only general conference can deal with. When you get into the part of the Book of Discipline that deals with structural issues and, and um, committees and how annual conferences operate, all, all those kind of things, those are the parts of the book, the administrative parts, that are going to be subject to uh, adaptation in the regional conferences. So that's the idea behind regionalization. What you need to know about regionalization is in order to be fully effective, there, are, there was a package of eight constitutional amendments that have to be made. And constitutional amendments cannot be approved only by action of the general conference. The general conference votes on the constitutional amendments, and if two-thirds of the delegates support the constitutional change, then the next step is the constitutional amendments go to every annual conference for vote. And so beginning sometime this fall through next summer, all the annual conferences around the world will be voting on these eight constitutional amendments. And after every annual conference has cast votes, then the Council of Bishops will collect all those votes and they'll canvass the votes. And if there's a two-thirds aggregate vote in support of the constitutional amendments, then the Council of Bishops will certify that, that the annual conferences have voted to ratify the constitutional amendments. So that'll be, I mean, it'll be sometime next year before that process is complete. If the constitutional amendments are all ratified, then the legislation that General Conference passed will come into effect. And we'll start to see this change and this addition of a new layer of conferencing, at least in the United States. 
Um, if one or more of the constitutional amendments fail, it's going to impact how much of the legislation becomes effective and dependent on you know, which, which constitutional amendments and which pieces of legislation are affected and can't be enforced. It, it, could, it could create a situation where um, the whole thing becomes a gigantic mess that has to be cleaned up later on. But that's something we won't know until the annual conferences have all voted. Um, and then the, the third big R uh, is, was the revised social principles. So I mentioned to you the first official social principles went into the Book of Discipline in 1972. If you look back to 1908, the Methodist Episcopal Church actually adopted a social creed that was 11 points. It had mostly to do with workers' rights. That happened in 1908. The, the Methodist Episcopal Church South the Brethren Church and the United Church then followed suit in the 20s and 30s by adopting similar social creeds. So when the 1968 Book of Discipline was adopted at the Uniting Conference, there were, there were social statements in the Book of Discipline, but they weren't organized into social principles. That's what happened in 1972. We've kind of, every four years when General Conference meets, we tinker around with the language of the social principles. Now, one thing that I noticed when I was looking in my in my 68 discipline, the the section of the 68 discipline that refers to statements on social issues is six pages long. So we went from 1908, one page with 11 points. By 1968, we've got six pages in the discipline that are social issue statements. In the 2016 book of discipline, it's 50. We have 50 pages of social principles. And so you can see how, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to say that it's good or bad, I'm just offering that as an example of how that's become one of the real focuses of general conference is working on the language of the social principles. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we hear from central conference delegates every time we meet is that so much of what's said in the social principles is really only relevant in the United States. And, and I think the reason for that is because the only time the U.S. delegates have a chance to get together and talk about stuff is at General Conference. And when you talk about stuff at General Conference, it ends up in the Book of Discipline. And so there is a lot of stuff in the social principles, in the discipline in general, that really is just irrelevant outside the United States. So one of the things that the bodies that have been working on the revision to the social principles were trying to do was to streamline the language <coughs> and also make the language more globally relevant. Because if regionalization comes into effect, then each region is gonna have the ability to adopt statements that they're not gonna be the social principles, but there'll be statements in the nature of social principles for that region that apply to that region. And, and so that was the, that's the thinking behind the revision to the social principles. The last, I'm, I'm gonna say one more thing and then I'm going to wrap up and we're going to go have lunch. Well, two more things. We made significant changes to the way we um, assign bishops and pay bishop salaries in the United Methodist Church. And so just know that we are going, the last time, 2016, we had about, I think there were 47 active bishops in the United States. As of 2024, we're funding 32 active bishops in the United States. So we, over the last eight years, we have reduced the number of bishops in the United States by eight. And we're feeling that in the Southeast. I mean, you know, if you have kept up with what's going on in Holston, you know that we currently share our bishop with North Alabama. Um, and that's happening all over in the United States, that more and more annual conferences are either merging or they're redrawing the lines of Episcopal areas or they're joining together annual conferences um, to, share, to share bishops because one of the things we're struggling with is the, the administrative costs at the denominational level right now. 
And so I served on a task force at the general church level that worked on the legislation that was adopted around bishops. I wrote some of this legislation. I would love to spend about three hours talking about that, but I won't. Um, but uh, if you have questions about bishops, come see me during lunch. The budget that we adopted for the next four years is a 42% reduction from the last quadrennial, quadrennial budget we adopted. It's the smallest budget the United in, in actual, well, in, in, I guess, real dollars. Um, it's the smallest budget the United Methodist Church has ever adopted. It's about 350, depending on some of the contingencies in the language of funding the budget, it'll be between 350 and $375 million over a four-year period. The last thing that I want to mention to you, and, and Rhonda mentioned this a few weeks ago, um, is, and this is uh, an historically significant uh, occurrence, and, and that is the General Conference voted to give sacramental authority to clergy who, who are in the order of deacons. And, and so uh, historically, deacons have been ordained to ministries of love, justice, and service. Elders, like Rhonda is an, is an ordained elder, elders are ordained to the ministry of word and sacrament. And so deacons traditionally have assisted elders with, um, with administration of the sacraments. And there was some language recently in the Book of Discipline that allowed the bishop under special circumstances to give limited sacramental authority to deacons um, for a specific purpose in a particular context. Now we are, we've given deacons sacramental authority across the board. And um, some, many, I will say, are celebrating that because of new opportunities that it's going to create. So when you, know, you think about deacons are serving as chaplains in nursing homes and chaplains in hospitals, they're working in youth ministry, they're working in camping ministry, they're working in music ministries, they're, they're working in all kinds of ministries where there might be opportunities to offer Holy Communion, to offer uh, baptism, where there's not a, an elder present to do that. And so now deacons have the authority to uh, exercise discretion in, in doing those things. And I think that's something to really celebrate. There, there are also those who, as we always do, will whine and moan because it's not the way we've ever done it before and it'll take a little getting used to. But I think that was a, that was a truly historic moment um, at General Conference when we, when we approved that legislation. Um, let me let me wrap up by offering some, and I'm going to apologize because I, I said I was only going to talk for 15 minutes, and I didn't. Um, in uh, John John Wesley famously said, "If we cannot think alike, may we not love alike." The Methodist movement started when John and Charles Wesley were students at Oxford College in the 1720s, and they got together with 10 or 11 of their friends at school who came from different theological backgrounds, and the purpose of their weekly gathering was to talk about the things they didn't agree about. That, that is the heart of Methodism. We don't demand that everybody who comes in the door to the sanctuary agrees 100% on every single issue. There are some things that we consider to be our common core of Christian beliefs that we all do agree on. But there are a lot of things that we talk about in the United Methodist Church that if, we, if I asked everybody to line up down front and I read one of the statements of social principles and I said, if you really agree with that, go stand over there. And if you really disagree with that, stand over there. And if you're not sure, stand right here. And we did that for each and every statement in the social principles. Let me promise you something you would notice. There would always be a group on that wall. There would always be a group on that wall. And there would always be a group right there. And as I moved from social principle to social principle, people would move from group to group. 
So the people who are on that wall for social principle A, some of them might be over here for social principle B. And some of them are going to be right there for social principle C. That, that's an illustration of what the Methodist Church is about. There, there has been a movement in recent years, for whatever reason, to say that, that there are people who want to convince you, us, that in order to be effective as a denomination, we all have to think the same thing the same way about the same issues. And I don't know that we recognize heresy in the United Methodist Church, but if, if we did, I think that would be about as close as you can come to a, a, an heretical statement in the United Methodist Church. Because it's just not us, it's just not Wesleyan to say that we all agree 100% of the time on every issue. And, and I'll tell you, there are things that happened at General Conference that I celebrate. And there are things that happen at General Conference that I lament. There are things that I agree with wholeheartedly. And there are things that if we still had a room in Charlotte, I'd still be standing on the floor arguing against them. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter so much what I think or what, or what my opinion is. What matters is that we're able to gather like this for the purpose of worshiping together, for the purpose of fellowshipping together, for the purpose of being in mission and ministry together. And we can do that without arguing about what we think about this or that issue. I hope you noticed when you came up for communion this morning that when you were offered communion, the words that were spoken was, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ given for you. We didn't ask you, what do you think about the verdict in the Trump case? We didn't ask you who you're voting for in November. We didn't ask you, what do you think about development, residential development in Tarkland Valley? You know, we all have opinions on that stuff, but that's not what matters. What matters is that we're offered Christ, and in turn, we offer Christ to the world. And I, I hope, I'm confident this congregation is going to find a way to keep navigating that. And I'm hopeful that as a denomination, our congregations can continue to find ways to navigate that. Thank you all so much. And, uh, privileged to have Dell with us to explain and navigate all of this because I'll tell you I'm not going to read it all and we do have the power we've always had the power we have never in the history of this church all agreed I don't expect it to happen now I expect you to do exactly what you've been doing and that is love each other love God love our community and serve as we have always done. At this time, I think Patrick's going to sing, we're going to sing one verse of a final hymn because we got to sing, and then I will have the benediction and blessing. Let's stand and we'll sing a verse of Softly and Tenderly. That's 479 in the celebration hymnal. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come
you go from this place knowing that through the power of Jesus Christ, you always have a place to come home. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for all of those who have gone before us to pave the way to this moment, especially your son, Jesus Christ. We ask your blessing upon our fellowship time together that you would use this food to strengthen us and to send us out to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen.